Hello, my name is Geraint Wild, and I'm the business manager for life science cameras and microscopy here at Andor. Presentation today is going to be on democratizing confocal microscopy, a new benchtop microscope to boost productivity. After years of experience of watching people use our high speed confocals in their research and watching them actually use them increasingly for routine work, we thought what a game changer it would be to be able to take those large confocal systems and package them into a box small enough to put into a regular laboratory and make it part of a routine laboratory workflow. This culminated in our brand new BC43 and or benchtop confocal. Many people section thick samples or specimens before staining. Often this is because it helps with antibody penetration, for example, and subsequent labeling. But also people may section because when you eventually put them under the microscope, you're able to see the detail in the sample more clearly, and then you image a section at a time and rebuild your understanding of that larger specimen in the whole. However, confocal microscopy, even in samples that, where antibodies don't necessarily penetrate that deeply, would still mean that you could get away with slightly thicker samples or thicker sections, I should say, and then image them more in 3D. After all, life exists in 3D, so why image in 2D if you don't have to? Any of you already familiar with confocal microscopy will be used to something like one of these two systems you see in the images here. They're typically designed for pretty complex experiments and are actually fairly excessive for routine imaging. They're quite expensive to purchase and to run. They have a large footprint will typically be found in a core facility where you have an imaging expert to help you. They have quite a long learning curve and they're often in a specialized room or require a specialized room such as a dark room, which you may not always have easy access to. When designing the BC43, we wanted to make confocal microscopy accessible to as many people as possible. We wanted to make it affordable, obviously. We wanted to have a small footprint so that it could fit on your bench top and therefore be part of a high productivity workflow. We needed it to be super fast to learn and we wanted it to have low running costs. As I mentioned earlier, we realized that not all experiments necessarily need confocal microscopy. So consequently, the BC43 is a multimodal imaging system. It's three imaging solutions in one. We have transmitted light microscopy, so this is bright field and a technique which I'll come to called differential phase contrast. So this allows you to image unstained samples. Then we have wide field microscopy. So this is fluorescence, more conventional fluorescence microscopy. And then if your sample is thick or is uh, suitable for, for confocal imaging, then we have the confocal microscopy modality. So we give you the benefit of all worlds depending on your experimental type and the desired outcome of your experiment. So let's start with transmitted light microscopy. The most basic form of this is bright field illumination, where you have a uniform column of light illuminating your sample, and then any natural contrast in your sample is picked up by the objective and ultimately in your final image. This is fine for samples that have natural contrast in them, like plant or small model organisms like Daphnia. However, if you have cultured cells which are transparent, then this method is less useful. For unstained samples and for samples that have very little contrast in them, we have developed the unique technique of differential phase contrast, or what we call DPC. In DPC, we actually illuminate the sample from a slight angle, unlike in Brightfield, which was a uniform column of light passing through the sample. Here, the angle of illumination means that we end up with a slightly 3D looking effect of the sample, and I'll show you that shortly. One of the nice things about DPC is that there's no need for specific objectives. For those of you who use phase contrast objectives, you may or may not be aware that inside that objective is a phase ring, and the phase ring can cut out some of the light that comes passes through the objective. For fluorescence imaging, it's nice to have nothing in the objective to maximize the signal and therefore sensitivity for imaging. And then, unlike in DIC, we have no need for polarization optics, which add expense to the system. So 
So DPC delivers high contrast and high resolution imaging, even in unstained samples. This is an example of DPC being used to image a soulfish sample. You can see that we can then combine this with imaging modalities such as Widefield or Confocal. In this case, you can see us combining it with Confocal. So the DPC does give you an extra level of detail that you wouldn't otherwise have in the fluorescent sample alone. The soulfish is quite a thick sample. More challenging would be a monolayer of cells such as here. So here you can see that we're actually using DPC quite clearly to image cells both stained and unstained. And what's worth noting is that DPC works with plastic dishes. DIC, which gives you a similar 3D effect to DPC, uses polarization optics and, and plastic wear interferes with that polarization and so renders D DIC useless. So DPC has an advantage here in many ways. So moving on to fluorescence microscopy and the most commonly used form, which is wide field illumination. In wide field illumination, again, like transmitted light illumination and bright field, you have an evenly illuminated column of light shining at your sample. But in this case, it's a fluorescence, a specific fluorescence wavelength, such as 488 nanometers for imaging GFP. In this instance, the objective will capture all of the light that's in the focal plane of the objective and additional light that's coming back from the sample. Widefield systems are extremely useful, for example, for thin samples. So if the sample is thin, then you, don't, you can focus pretty much on the sample and you don't get too much out of focus information back from it. It's good for fast events. Here you have always have the maximum number of photons getting to your camera and therefore you can have the shortest exposures and the fastest frame rates. It's also very good for live cell imaging. If you have cells or samples that are particularly photosensitive uh, and their physiology changes with too much light, then wide field can be very gentle illumination and therefore prolong the life and, the, and preserve the behavior of cells when being imaged. And also it means you can image samples with very low signal. So if you have very low expression of, for example, GFP or other fluorescent proteins in your cells, then by capturing all of the light from the sample, you can get away with detecting extremely low samples when we have a sensitive camera such as we have in the BC43 and and or SCMOS camera. Probably one of the best litmus tests for phototoxicity of a microscopy system is actually following cell division. Cells are very sensitive to phototoxic levels of light and they won't divide if there's too much light and that's harming them. Here you can see BC43 imaging for 24 hours in this case and cell division is occurring frequently and consistently over that time. Of course, we can image for longer than that, particularly if you put an incubator on the BC43 as well. So many of us are interested in the intercellular structure of a cell. So for example, actin, the cytoskeleton, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, or elements of the nucleus. To see these, we need to go to a high magnification. However, at a high magnification in wide field, you don't just only get what's in focus in the focal plane of the objective, but you also pick up the detailed signal of the, in the outer focus planes. And these contribute to a final image that has this hazy look about it. Ultimately, what we want to do is try and clear that haze away, put the outer focus information back where it belongs and end with a much higher contrast, more detailed image. There are a number of techniques, well-established techniques that are called, that are known as either deconvolution, image restoration, or digital clearing. And these algorithms are well-established and trusted. And when you apply them, they basically clear up your image, restoring the outer focus information from where it originated. And now you have a much higher contrast, more detailed, higher resolution image. If we take a look at this, this cell, so this is a cell metaphase that's in metaphase going through cell division. So it's rounded up. So here we've got an XY view here. And then we can also see the YZ and XZ view. So we can actually see detail through its entire structure quite clearly. And this is the same image here that's been 
deconvolved or has had image restoration done to it. So you can see how much clearer the detail is in that sample and the resolution and detail you can get from a 3D image. So we can image very nicely in white field and using deconvolution, restore the image so that we get a lot of detail that we wouldn't have otherwise seen and captured. And we can easily apply this deconvolution to time series, for example. So if we were to image a cell over time at high resolution, at high magnification, I should say, for high resolution, then we can just completely deconvolve that in time, time series and see how the cell structure is changing over time. And this is just a quick movie to show you each Z plane as we go up and down through the sample, showing you the detail in each layer. In Fusion that controls both our BC43 and our Dragonfly confocal series, we're able to actually capture and visualize in real time 3D data stacks, stacks as the Z series are captured from the microscope. And this is because we have the Amaris visualization engine in Fusion. We can obviously then take those files, export them to Amaris and do things like surface rendering, such as you're seeing here, which allows you to inspect your sample in 3D in much greater detail. And you can then go on to even count features. For example, if you're looking at cancer cells in a population and treatments, you can use Amaris to count or measure differences between treatment and control groups and therefore analyze your data in much more detail, multiple cells, multi-well plates as a high throughput workflow. Okay, so I've just shown you that we can capture fluorescence images and use deconvolution to give you high contrast images just using wide field illumination. So why do you need a confocal? Well, as you saw, even in wide field images, you do have background uh, signal from out of focus information. And of course, if you could move straight to confocal, it would remove the step of having to do deconvolution. So giving you the highest contrast and sharpest images at all times. In addition to that, wide field with deconvolution only really gets you so far. And as you move to samples that are thicker than say 30 or 50 microns, it becomes increasingly challenging for wide field microscopy and deconvolution to work. Anything over 50 microns definitely becomes challenging. And so this is where confocal starts to benefit because you can go 50 microns into several hundred microns depending on your sample and its preparation. This is where wide field and digital clearing or deconvolution methods will start to falter. Here is a great example of confocal working well in a thick sample. This specimen is a 521 micron thick example of a cleared soulfish. Here you can see the wide field image from that sample. Stained in this image are um, tubulin, which is picking up the nervous structure, and myosin, which will be picking up muscular structure in yellow. If I now show you the confocal image, you can see how much clearer that confocal image is. You can see the fine structure here now in the nerve cells uh, and the neurons, and also you're starting to see the muscular structure as well. This is at 10x magnification, so it's still at relatively low mag, but you're already seeing an amazing amount of detail in what is a very thick sample using confocal. There's no additional deconvolution here. This is purely confocal on its own. You could in fact deconvolve further if you wanted to, even in confocal. And here you can see those images side by side. So the wide field on the left, with very little clear detail in it, and on the right hand side, the confocal, with its extreme clarity and contrast in its image. So at the start of my presentation, I mentioned the fact that not only have we produced a convenient and easy to use affordable benchtop confocal microscope in the BC43, but I also mentioned that it was high productivity. And I haven't really yet touched on this. In order to explain why it's a high productivity unit, I first of all need to tell you a little bit about confocal or the principles of confocal and how that works and therefore differentiate between the technology that we use in the BC43 
and the more commonly used conventional technology that you're probably more used to. So let's start off with a confocal microscope. Typically, a confocal is using a laser light source as its illumination using a point of light. And then that is hits a dichroic mirror. It passes down through the objective or optics to the specimen. And then it passes back up through the objective. The emitted wavelength, which is longer than the excitation wavelength, passes through the dichroic mirror. And then the light hits a pinhole. And this pinhole is in the light path to basically only allow in focus information through and block any out of focus information. So in this instance, the red line or the orange line is indicating out of focus information and therefore is getting blocked by this uh, solid mask either side of the pinhole. And any in focus information, which you see here with the green, actually passes through the confocal pinhole and reaches the detector, which in our case in the BC43 is a scientific camera. And basically, the pinhole is the key part of a confocal microscope here. Now, there are two probably most popular forms of uh, microscopy systems with pinholes in them. Certainly by far the most common one, and most of you are familiar with, would be a point scanning confocal. In the case of a point scanning confocal, you have a single pinhole and a single point of light illuminating the sample at any one time. The other technology that is available for uh, confocal imaging is multi-point confocal or spinning disc. In this case, you have a disc full of pinholes which spins at high speed, which means that you're actually illuminating the sample constantly with thousands of pinholes and so getting uh, an image across an entire sensor. I have a next slide to explain this in more detail. So on the left, we have a spinning disc confocal. Here you can see the spinning disc that I mentioned with thousands of pinholes. And these pinholes are constantly illuminating the sample at high speed. So the sample is being illuminated, the entire sample is being illuminated confocally. If you compare this and contrast this to the point scanning confocal, what a point scanner is doing is illuminating the sample a point of light at a time, scanning from left to right or right to left, and then line by line. The result is that it's capturing an image over a longer period of time because of the way that it scans. If you add to this and you consider the camera technology or the sorry the sensor technology behind these two different types of confocal, in the case of a spinning disc confocal and the BC43, we use scientific cameras. These cameras are able to capture an entire full field image complementing the spinning disc and the thousands of pinholes that we're illuminating in a single snap, compared with that of a point scanner, which has a photomultiplier tube and therefore captures or detects a point of light at a time, tracking and matching in the light path, the scanning laser that's exciting the sample. Additionally, scientific cameras have a quantum efficiency. So this is the ability for the detector to capture light from your sample, the quantum efficiency, the efficiency of capturing light is about 80% in the camera of the BC43, which is considerably more than the quantum efficiency of a photomultiplier tube in a point scanner confocal, which is around about 45% QE. This does mean quite often that in the case of a point scanner, to get an equivalent signal from the same sample, you need to expose your sample for longer to light. And this can obviously then lead to phototoxicity or photo bleaching, which is something I referred to earlier in my presentation. This is detrimental to things like cell health if you're doing live cell imaging. And even if, and if you're imaging thick samples, for example, then you're also subject to more photo bleaching. 
because you're illuminating the sample repeatedly as you go deeper and deeper into the sample and so this can result in photo bleaching and losing signal before you reach the end of your sample depth. So the result is that for spinning disk confocal you have a fast and highly productive confocal system that's approximately eight times or more faster than the point scanner and this very much depends on the resolution that you're capturing your images at and your experimental setup but typically it's at least eight times or more productive having a spinning disk confocal compared with a point scanner. As an example of this here is a 93 micron thick Drosophila egg chamber. So this is 93 microns thick and it has two colors in it. Uh, the nuclei are stained in yellow and um, then you have a cytoskeletal structure stained in cyan. So we have two colors that we're imaging. This 93 micron thick sample was captured over 309 Z planes to create the volume. And the actual resolution of the image or the pixel dimension is 2048 pixels by 2000 pixels. And this was captured in just over two minutes. This is really fast. If you were to compare this to a point scanner at a light for light resolution, then you would be looking at something closer to 20 minutes or more. So in this instance, we're about 10 times faster with a BC43 than an equivalent point scanner confocal image. So let me tell you a little bit more about the BC43 itself. I've obviously seen lots of great images so far and I've explained the benefits of confocal microscopy. But let's, uh, let's give you a bit more information about the BC43 uh, in terms of the kind of experiments um, and, and the benefits that it can bring to you. So first and foremost, uh, what's, what's great about the BC43 is Fusion, the software that drives it and captures the images, as I mentioned earlier, has the Amaris 3D visualization engine in it. This means that we are literally able to show you the 3D image forming as, your, as the system is capturing a volume. This is great if you're setting up your experiment and you want to quickly want to quickly establish if you've actually set up your, for example, your Z parameters, so your start and your end to capture all of the sample you want to image, if you've set that up correctly. If you haven't, then you'll quickly find out, you'll be able to stop the experiment, reset your parameters and start again. The BC43 has four excitation laser lines, 405, 488, 561 and 637 nanometers. So this basically plays into most of the common uh, fluorophores like DAPI, GFP, Alexa 488, RFP uh, and Alexa uh, uh, 640, for example. So it'll do all of the common fluorophores that people are typically using. We have Borealis uniform illumination. So this is something very specific to Andor. We have this both in the BC43 and also in our higher end um, Dragonfly uh, confocal microscopy systems. And Borealis basically gives us this uniform illumination and uniform illumination is really important when, you want, when you're wanting to, well for two things, when you want to, want to image large specimens where you're going to be doing uh, tiling images and then stitching them together into a montage in order to give you a much larger uh, final image of a, of a big sample. And if you don't have uniform, uniform illumination then you can end up with this sort of pin cushion effect uh, between all of the images so it doesn't look that great but also of course if you're wanting to analyze an image and, and, and using intensity image intensity information as a means of quantifying then you want that intensity to be as even as possible right to the edge of the field um, particularly if you're comparing structures uh, and, and you want those structures to be the same in the middle of the field as, as they are at the edges of the field um, so that the intensity information is meaningful. For ease of use, uh, obviously now you can see here, this is a box instrument with a lid. There's no eyepieces, it's not a conventional microscope. So we need to give you some assistance in actually finding your sample in the first place. We do have a joystick uh, to navigate around your sample, but we also give you tools to both find your sample in the first place. So this is Focus Seek. And then once you found your sample, particularly for example in live cell experiments, we're able to then also lock onto the sample to keep it in focus 
um, and keep it in focus regardless of, for example, as if the, uh, regardless of the temperature in your lab changing. So we have focus, seek and lock. We also have a quick sample overview. So this is great. We start with a very low, ma a very low magnification objective, a 2x objective. So this gives you a very big macro view of your sample so that you can then uh, very easily set the area that you're interested in viewing uh, and then obviously zoom in with the other objectives in the BC43. Those objectives range from the 2x that I mentioned uh, right up to 60x magnification. Uh, and shortly beyond that. And also we have a built-in anti-vibration mechanism. So in the base of the unit here, we have little anti-vibration uh, feet. And so that means that it can live on a bench, as you can see here, quite happily next to uh, a little mini centrifuge, or it could be like a vortex mixer. Uh, but, but even with those on the bench, you're still able to continue imaging. So this sample is a great example of Borealis illumination in action. So here we have a large section of tissue. Uh, the, the, the tissue, the image here has been captured over 77 Z planes uh, and at four colors. But the important part here is that it's a stitched image. So this individual image that you're looking at here is actually made up of 28 separate images that have been tiled and then stitched together using our stitcher in Fusion. So in total, this image is 15,092 images. But as you can see, looking at this image, there is no way you could tell that this is made up of 28 individual tiles. It's completely seamless imaging with even illumination in all wavelengths. On additional note, it's worth noting that these 15,092 images were captured in just 30 minutes. And as I said earlier, a, point, a typical point scanner would take probably take at least six hours to capture this. This slide here is demonstrating this, the quick sample overview that we make available to you. So I mentioned earlier that we have a 2x objective. In addition to that 2 objective, which gives you a nice macro view, we also have something called quick montage. So we can very quickly do, for example, a three, three by three sample overview. And then once you have that three by three sample overview, you can click anywhere in the specimen and the stage will move to that position. So that then when you move to a higher magnification objective, you're immediately where you want it to be. And so within seconds from putting your sample on the microscope to moving to a high mag objective, you're able to focus and get on with capturing a volume at that higher magnification. As I mentioned earlier, we've really tried hard to make the BC43 as easy as possible to use and therefore have a super fast learning curve um, for anybody new to the system uh, and, and to get to a point where they're imaging a multi-dimensional experiment as quickly as possible. So I've already shown you that we have some tools for starting imaging as quickly as possible once you've got your sample on the microscope. I've also mentioned the fact that we help you find and maintain uh, the sample focus with our focus seek and lock mechanism uh, methodology. This then helps you move into multi-dimensional acquisition and we have a very easy to use multi-dimensional acquisition interface where you can capture both time, multi-channel, Z stacks, um, multi-field, multi-well and any combination of those uh, in, in a complete experiment. And then on top of that, we also have additional processing tools such as deconvolution or digital clearing, as some people call it, and also uh, image stitching or montage. And in there we have the Amaris stitcher and we can have both of these uh, processing tools as inline image processing. So once your experiment is completed, uh, those uh, processing tools can then start working. It does mean, for example, if you've got an experiment that finishes in the early hours of the morning, then those uh, the image stitching and or the deconvolution can start work overnight so that when you come in come back into the lab in the morning the experiment is finished uh, and everything is ready for you to review so whilst we were testing the bc43 we took the opportunity to obviously put it in front of new users and compare their learning ability on the bc43 compared with uh, their experience on a point scanner confocal and the measuring point we took was their ability 
to capture the majority of the um, multi-parameter or sorry, multi-dimensional imaging uh, protocols. So for example, being able to capture a multi-channel experiment, a multi-channel experiment with Z, multi-channel experiment over time, multi-field uh, experiment, uh, etc. So we'd look at their ability to be able to perform most of those different imaging protocols and we compared that to a point scanner. And what we found was that with some minimal tutorial, uh, and these were just little videos, short videos, instructional videos for them to work with, that within an hour they were already be able to capture using all of the imaging protocols available to them. Um, whereas in the case of a point scanning confocal, they found that it took them longer. Now there is a reason for this, obviously. The BC43 is a simpler, exper is a simpler system. We have uh, very easy to use software. The interface is very clear, clean and easy to follow. Uh, and point scanners, they are more sophisticated uh, pieces of kit. They're capable of doing uh, some very clever different imaging techniques, etc. Uh, but for routine imaging, which is what we're talking about and focusing on here, then the BC43 was much easier to learn to use. And consequently, of course, more productive for those who are wanting to use it. So this is great for you know, going into a lab where you might have a, you know, quite a turnover of project students or you've got uh, new PhD students starting and you're not an, as a PI maybe, for example, you're not an expert yourself. Uh, so, you, so training them would otherwise be uh, a challenge. If you're a core facility manager, obviously the BC43, if you need something for routine imaging, then a BC43 is great for new users to come in to start to learn to use a confocal. Um, it means that your tuition time, the time spent with them tutoring them on how to use the equipment is, is shortened, considerably shortened, uh, and so life becomes a little bit easier for you as well in that respect. Here's just one example of a workflow just to give you a sense of, of the Fusion software and how easy it is to use. So in this instance we've got a sample on our BC43. We've taken an overview of that sample using the LOMAG objective and then we've selected the particular, in this case, Drosophila embryo that we're interested in, and then clicked that to move it to the center of the um, image of the camera. Then we've moved to a higher magnification. And when we go to higher mag and we just do a little bit of fine focusing, it'll be already close to focus, but we just do a little final adjustment once it's on the higher magnification objective, uh, in this case, a 40X. Then uh, immediately we can see the Drosophila that we selected and then we're able to move to setting up, in this case, a Z-Stack. So this is the Z-Stack panel here on the right where we can set our end and our start, or we can set a center and say how many microns each side, for example, we want to go. And then we just press acquire. And then that obviously ultimately results in a final image. In this instance, where this is a 3D MIP, so this is a 3D image, but just uh, squashed into a maximum intensity projection, so therefore, uh, is a 2D, 2D representation of that image. And then the interface is in three very simple uh, sections. The image interface, this is your navigation panel, so this is how you navigate your sample, your objective uh, selection, your wavelength, your exposure, uh, and you know, your XY control for moving around the sample. And then on the right hand side here, which can expand and collapse, uh, R is where you set up your protocols, so your Z stacks, your time series, your multi world, etc. So it's a very simple workflow from left to right, um, covering all the various parameters, imaging parameters you would want to cover. So, so this is just a quick example of the focus seek and lock, most specifically the focus lock. So during a live cell experiment, which can last for hours or even days, you want the microscope to stay perfectly in focus on your sample. And things that can fight against that, for example, might be changes in the, in the temperature of your laboratory. So what, fe what focus lock does is it locks onto the, uh, onto the cover slip that your sample is uh, adhered to. And then if any change in temperature happens over time to cause the sample to go out of focus or the cover slip to move relative to the objective, then the um, focus lock mechanism will correct for this. So in this image, you can see cells are dividing. 
but that the cells stay perfectly in focus in all four of these fields. So all of the data I've shown you so far has either been of fixed samples or relatively slow cell dynamics of live uh, experiments, so such as cell division. However, it is possible to go faster with the BC43, uh, either in confocal or wide field mode, and we can go up to 44 frames per second. That would be using a 10 millisecond exposure, for example. Um, and it also means that um, we can you know, look at relatively fast cellular dynamics. So for example, in this, uh, in this situation here, in this particular experiment, we're looking at GFP tag EB1. So this is looking at microtubule plus uh, tips growing from the centrosomes of the cell that is going into mitosis. So over time, you can see quite clearly how the microtubule tips are moving, what direction they're moving in. Uh, and this particular experiment was captured at two frames per second over a six minute period. Uh, and that was primarily run at that frame rate because these were very low expressive, very low signals in this sample. So we did need to have slightly longer exposures than your 10 milliseconds uh, when you're running at your fastest. So obviously the, the speed that you run at is dependent upon the amount of signal that you have and therefore the length of your exposures. But faster dynamic uh, imaging is possible with a BC43. So BC43 is really a very versatile imaging system. So great for bringing into the heart of your laboratory and fantastic if your research spans from something the scale of a cell right through to multicellular structures or even full organisms. So we have already with BC43 image cell lines, stem cells, cell tissues, organoids, drosophila, zebrafish, flatfish, um, mouse mammalian cells, chicken uh, cells even, um, and many others could be used. So there's a full scale here available to you as researchers from using just this one instrument. This slide summarizes nicely the scales that we're talking about. So I've shown you cell division through to multicellular structures such as the Drosophila egg chambers here, and then right through to being able to image whole tissue here such as a ring of intestine. Now imagine you're the owner of a BC43 and you've managed to capture all these amazing images. What more can you do with those images? What more can you learn from these data sets, especially the 3D ones? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Fusion saves in the Amaris file format, and Amaris is the market-leading analysis package for 3D image visualization and analysis. So let me show you an example. Here we have a zebrafin fish model that uh, is looking at bone regeneration. And what's happened here is the investigator, the researcher has damaged the bone and is looking at the regeneration process. The bone that you can see labeled in magenta is newly formed bone and the bone in green is the old original bone. Additionally labeled in this sample are osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are bone resorbing cells that help in the repair process. So all of these little individual yellow dots are osteoclasts. And the researcher in this instance would be interested in the activity of the osteoclasts in relation to the bone repair mechanism. So how do we analyze this? Well, first of all, we need to uh, understand or we need to uh, establish the areas of the sample that we're interested in. So here predominantly, the researcher is interested in the newly formed bone and the little yellow dots, the osteoclasts. So we need to tell the software what to analyze. Now we could use manual segmentation, which is based on intensity and manually move sliders up and down to try and define uh, this area of, of pink, this magenta area. But why do that when you have AI uh, or machine learning capabilities? So what we can do is we can teach the software the, 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 the um, pattern, the, the pixel distribution and pattern of this magenta label. And by teaching the software, it will automatically then detect all of the, uh, all of the similar uh, pixel, pixel, classified pixels uh, that, that match uh, that pattern. So 
for example, if you look to the right hand side of the image now, we've taught Imaris what the magenta area should uh, look like from a pixel classification perspective. And it is now automatically detecting all of these uh, areas of regeneration of bone. And not only that is uh, it will go on to uh, shortly to also identify all of these little osteoclasts as individual spots. So if I move on a step now, you can see if we look to images one and two on the right, you can see well, I've removed the raw image and you're left with the um, AI taught regions of the newly formed bone. And in addition to that, you can see that the osteoclasts are no longer all yellow because what we've done is we've done spot detection in Amaris and then we've color coded those osteoclasts according to how close they are to the newly formed areas uh, in, in the regenerated bone. So we're now able to look at, for example, measure uh, elements like uh, distance from the, uh, from the newly forming bone or the density around the newly forming bone. If I take this a step further, what we can do just to make this a little bit more uh, accurate and less subjective is that having used the pixel classifier to determine the areas of interest of so the, re the regenerating bone, we're then able to also create some larger envelopes so let's say a perimeter vicinity that would be um, localized to each of those individual uh, bones in the fin of the zebrafish. And by doing so, and by sort of segmenting areas like this, we're more easily able to then um, identify those osteoclasts that, that are within a useful vicinity of the regenerating bone and then make a more accurate calculated appraisal or uh, analysis of numbers of osteoclasts within a specific region around each of the repairing bones according to where they are in the regeneration process. So you can see, for example, in this middle uh, fin bone here, we have the highest density of active osteoclasts. And then as you move away to, to the left where regeneration is, is more complete, the osteoclast number drops. And actually, if you look to the right where the bone repair process is only just beginning, then you see that you start with low numbers on the right hand side. And then as the regeneration uh, progresses, you see more and more osteoclasts moving into the area of the bone that's regenerating. And all this has been, or sorry, half of this, because the, the spot detection isn't uh, AI, but uh, in terms of uh, defining these areas so that we can actually set up these uh, measurements, then this is all done using machine learning. So then your final image looks like this. So this is, was the original raw data on the left. And on the right is the segmented machine learning segmented um, analysis and its visual representation in terms of how we've segmented the image and counted the spots relative to that segmentation. So to summarize, BC43 is a benchtop confocal. It does, however, have three modalities, imaging modalities, multipoint confocal, wide field fluorescence microscopy, and transmitted light microscopy with bright field and differential phase contrast. It has a small footprint, so it easily fits onto your bench. There's no need for a dark room, so it can be on a, just in a regular bench with uh, near windows. You can have it in the lab or the corner of a facility. It's compact so it can fit quite easily alongside other elements of your bench like mini centrifuges and preparation areas. And consequently, it's high productivity. So you can be imaging one sample whilst you're preparing the next. It has a super fast learning curve and is a more affordable confocal imaging system than most of those that you use today. It's basically multi-dimensional microscopy made easy and produces stunning 3D images 
in an instant. So thank you for your time and I'm ready to take any questions that you have. So thank you everybody for taking the time to uh, sit through my webinar. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, I've seen now that there's a, a few questions come in, so I'll start going through those questions. I notice a few of you have asked if, uh, actually, sorry, let me put my, webinar, uh, put my webcam on to be a little bit more sociable. Oh, sorry, there we go, hello. Hi, <laughs> sorry about that. So thank you for attending. Um, so I shall just go through some questions. Uh, I noticed there was a few questions on, can we share the presentation either in PDF uh, format or recorded? We certainly will be making the recording available. Uh, interestingly, PDF isn't something we've been asked for before, but I'm sure we can arrange that. So we will, we obviously have your questions here registered. So we'll be able to send, we'll be able to contact you directly uh, and, and give you either access to the video or, or the, the recording of the webinar, I should say, or the or PDF. So uh, thanks for those inquiries. Um, magnification limit, uh, I did get to eventually, Breno. Uh, so um, 100x is what we, at the moment, we're, we're, we're actually incorporating the 100x into our, into our system. We have to program objectives in so that the focus seek and lock works, but shortly the 100x will be available. Um, Robert, is there any reason for using lasers as opposed to high powered LEDs? So because we are, a um, a spinning uh, a confocal system, we still have pinholes. And so there's, we still need a certain amount of power to get uh, enough light through the pinholes to the sample. So at the moment, uh, there are high powered LEDs that probably would have enough power in them, but we need the collimated, we, we need that focus collimated light, which we can produce uh, with, a, with a laser. And, um, uh, and, and more importantly, not all not all of the LEDs necessarily hit the high high points uh, that that we want. So we just use we use diode lasers in here, so they're pretty small lasers uh, inside the unit because that's how they fit into a single box like this. We don't have a separate laser box or engine. Everything is in this one unit. Uh, so so we have stuck with with lasers, but they're they're um, they're just simple diode lasers. Um, Nick, you said uh, you assume you'd have to take the sample off to add the oil. Uh, actually, no, uh, but it depends on your sample holder. If you've got a, uh, just simply something simply uh, like simple like a glass slide with a sample on it, um, and maybe one of those universal uh, sort of slide holders that you're familiar with, there's space around those. So what we do is we've actually built in a mechanism that once you've uh, found your sample and you've got it in focus on a lower mag, uh, when you want to add oil, Basically, we present you to a position. We present a position where there is no sample, where you can add oil, and then the sample moves back to exactly where you were, back into focus, and you're good to go. Um, next question is: How fine can the acquired fluorescence image bandwidth, Marie, um, be tuned to on this system? So the the if the emission bandwidths are, are just dictated by uh, more you know traditional filter bandwidths. So uh, we have we have very specific bandwidths for uh, for each wavelength to maximize to maximize the signal from the sample to the camera, but obviously trying to keep them as narrow as possible to minimize any sort of crosstalk uh, that we might get uh, between um, uh, crossover between filters. So I can give you more specific details uh, offline uh, in that regard if if you need to. Um, so. Um, Yes, the quick overview of images is also possible in wide field fluorescence. That's uh, not a problem. Uh, you can do it in wide field in, in fluorescence and in and in uh, the transmitted light. Um, let's have a look here. Uh, clarified tissue, uh, uh, cleared tissue. Uh, yes, I mean clear. So, so if you're using cleared tissue, I suppose cleared tissue is kind of the optimum, really, into optically, because obviously the, the the more cleared the tissue, the more optically transparent it is. So the 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 deeper we can image. So, oh yeah, if you can clear your tissue, then this is this is perfect. And obviously, clear tissue typically is quite thick. So the speed that we can image at, we can really churn through uh, cleared samples very very effectively. Um, 
Marie again, uh, multi-fluidics. Yes, actually, uh, theoretically, yes. But we are have, we, we're, we're actually investigating. Actually, your name looks familiar, so it might be it might be you. Um, we're actually looking into uh, the microfluidics system. So we certainly have the space on the unit to do it. It's more a case of handling the tubing, uh, et cetera. So um, we, we do believe it's possible, but, but there are so many solutions out there that we sort of need to look closely at each one to see what we can achieve. Um, so that would be a specific inquiry to us, and then we can investigate further. Uh, yes, we do have a lot of Portuguese images here. Uh, Oh, sorry, uh, Yoa, Yoa. Um, our testing was actually done uh, in one of the labs in Portugal, which is why you're seeing uh, so many images from there. Um, Johannes, we'll come back to you on that. Uh, no, no. So um, in terms of, so what are the camera specs uh, and can you choose different options? No, we have one camera in the BC43 and it's our a Zyla is our, our SCMOS camera that's in there. So um, it is, it's, it's specifically uh, that spec. So it's a scientific SCMOS. Um, if you want, we can give you more specific detail uh, on that camera offline. Uh, how many emission filters? At the moment, we have four emission filters. So we have an emission filter for each uh, excitation wavelength. So that's answering Bernard's question. Uh, as to, uh, the cost, we will again come to you directly on that because that depends on where in the world you are. So uh, we can uh, we, we can reach out directly on that question. Uh, there are maintenance contracts available. Um, there's a whole range of different options in terms of the level of, of, of uh, cover that you want. So again, we can reach out to you directly on that and, and give you a, a, an idea of the price ranges. Um, share the copy, share, oh gosh, we've got lots of questions coming in. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Durgesh, uh, question about can we image plant samples? We have actually imaged, we've imaged some root tips uh, and we have, oh, I can't remember the other sample we've, we've tried. We haven't done, we haven't done so many. We weren't able to test during, it was due to lockdown. We, we, we didn't really test much in the way of plant samples, but we can, we certainly can do, we've certainly imaged some root tip uh, and we can certainly pick up the autofluorescence and a lot of a lot of plant samples like convalaria, et cetera. So, so evidence tells us we can. Um, so it's uh, the next step would be obviously just trying. I, I, it depends what plant samples you have. I know some some samples can be more challenging than others depending on autofluorescence in the sample and and the wavelengths you're trying to to image. So I need a drink. Uh, so Simon, I think that probably answers your question. This is BC43 is a very new product. So at the moment, we don't have any existing customers using it for plant imaging. So all we have are some of the experience we've, experiences we've had in demoing. But obviously, please uh, get in touch with us if you want to find out more about what we have done already. Um, no, we can't add other lasers. So the idea of the system is that it, it, it remains simple and compact. So in doing so, we have had to restrict the laser combinations, but then that's why we have we have our other uh, series. So we have our Dragonfly series. Our Dragonfly series, you can have up to eight different wavelengths to cover all sorts of fluorophores right up into the NIR, so into the like sort of 780 nanometer end as well. Um, so, so that's really sort of the difference between the BC43 and why somebody might still want to invest in something like our Dragonfly series, which again is a high speed confocal, so very productive, because those give you much more flexibility in your choice. You can choose different camera types for different sensitivities, low light fluorescence, you know, regular fluorescence, and then a whole multitude of lasers, um, filter choices, et cetera. Uh, and, and also on the Dragonfly series, you can actually also start to add things like photostimulation devices and ablation and uh, DNA damage, uh, things like this, which, which again, you, you wouldn't be able to do on a BC43. Um, oh, the late, how long will the lasers last? The lasers last for uh, uh, thousands of hours. Um, bottom line is, they last for they should they should well it depends on your usage so it's really hard to to answer the question technically, but what we have in in the BC43 is we use a system and also in our dragonflies we use a system called active blanking so we only have the laser light on when we're exposing 
the sample and taking an image. So even in a Z stack, we would switch the laser off while we move and move to a new Z position and then switch it back on to capture the image. So the actually the the amount of time the laser is on is is you know, minimize it's, it's completely kept to a minimum. So, so technically, unless you know there's some technical issue with the lasers, and I guess anything can break down in, in real life, uh, then there's thousands of hours uh, of 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 lifespan on these on these lasers. Uh, there isn't a, a wide field only version available of uh, for this uh, BC43 um, at the moment. We, we just have the, the the full three modalities, Bernard. Uh, file format is the. Um, so I'm just looking at the time. The file format is uh, Imaris, so it's a .IMS format. So it is it is the Imaris format. We do uh, so. What happens is with the BC43, we also uh, supply a very um, sort of a basic version of the Imaris that allows you to. Uh, visualize to create movies to take snapshots etc so there you could always convert into other file formats uh, from there uh, yes uh, so johanna's question on um, environmental control yes so what we can do is we can put a stage stop incubator inside the bc43 on the side here i'm not sure if you're seeing my uh, presentation slide here but on the side here we have a little space where we can pull the we can have the tubes for uh, for the temperature sensor and the gas you know, the co2 etc humidity uh, and so yes we can keep cells alive for days potentially uh, on 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 the unit and we can control for 37 degrees c uh, and you can have different incubation options to regulate that 5% co2 sorry different gas control options i should say to regulate the the co2 um can it be read through bioformats, for example, Mathieu, the file format that we have? Um, wow, I should know that off the top of my head, but my memory is failing me. I think so, but it would be best that I go away and check uh, and give you more specific detail, because I know sometimes there's a little bit of a route uh, into bioformats. So um, we'll come back to you on that, Mathieu. Uh, the price again, uh, Ramiza. I will we'll reach out directly because it depends again uh, what country you're in, uh, what region you're in, etc., and what currency we're working in. Uh, is this the whole system, or are there some accessory? So this is this is what you're seeing is is essentially the whole system, but there are some accessories. So the accessories would be the environmental control. Not everybody wants the environmental control, um, and also obviously there's a choice of objectives. Um, so there's up to five positions uh, in the nose piece, but you choose the objectives that are relevant to your experimental needs. And then also around the workstation, we have some you know, additional data storage options, for example, uh, that you can choose uh, there as well. So not many additional options, but there are some. Um, Zebrafish, is it possible to do live imaging? Uh, I'm gonna have to probably stop on the question shortly. Uh, is it possible to do live lav? Oh yes. Uh, on a dish, not slide. Yeah, so actually we did do some um, fish lava uh, imaging. Uh, we have we have got, I think, a movie set that we tried on the BC43 during testing. Uh, frustratingly, as you probably know, if you do that imaging, it, it didn't always stay where we wanted it to. It was a little bit lively, at least a couple of times that we had a go. We didn't quite get the anesthetic and the gel um, I guess concentration, right? So, uh, so it, it is possible. We do have some movies in the end, uh, so we have imaged those. Um, no, uh, FRAP uh, and FRET experiments uh, would not be something that you could easily do on the BC43. Erwan. Uh, 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 yeah. So work. So Ahmed, you're asking about workshops. Uh, again, it uh, depends where you are, but we are very, very active with BC43. Our sales team at the moment are setting up workshops and doing road shows and arranging demos. So we will be, um, so so yes, yeah, so we, we have your details. So what we can do is we can give your contact details to the regional represent, re representative from Andor uh, and they can reach out and get in touch with you. Sorry, excuse me a second, I'm going to cough. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, I think that's pretty much the end of the, so anything around uh, pricing, we'll reach out to you directly, because as I said, that's that's sort of regional, that's down to different currencies, et cetera, as to, as to what that is, and I don't have all the currencies off the top of my head. Uh, so we'll reach out to you specifically uh, on that. So um, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for your questions. It's good, always good to see questions. It means that, some, that you have been, uh, somebody's been listening to me <laughs> and watching my presentation. So thank you very much. If you have any more questions, um, you can still, you know, we, we'll say we'll record these anyway, and we'll get, we'll reach out to you. But um, failing that, you can, you, you can always put inquiries via our web pages as well. So if you go onto our web pages and onto the BC43 page, even for example, you can re, you can request um, more information or pricing, etc. So um, yeah, that's not a problem. You don't you don't miss out on the opportunity just uh, because you haven't been able to to ask here. Okay, well, thank you very much, and we will wrap that up now. Thank you.